Culture through art. A group of San Antonio artists wanted to share their pride for the West Side through ceramics. And as part of Hispanic Heritage Month, the night team's Camelia Juarez shows us the beautiful sights of the West Side. Royal blue and white, the zip code 78207, birds singing. Some of the stories are traditional. For instance, if they have uh, uh, the parties, like see the tamaladas and things like that. Ana Uviedo is looking at the latest art exhibit called Arboles de la Vida de la West Side at the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center. So the traditional tree of life would have a married couple and the future children and 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 the grandparents and this is a takeoff on that so this is telling the stories of the west side Oviendo is one of the west side artists this year she built a tree with hens and roosters There's a lot of chickens in the west side the way you drive around they like to gather them and i used to like to feed them the and the way my mom fed them, that's the way we used to do. Another one of her trees celebrates the shotgun style houses, a kind of home found in the West Side neighborhoods. They're just so tiny, but I think they're just real cute. <laughs> we drove around looking at some. There's still a few in San Antonio. You go up Guadalupe Street and El Paso, close to Salsa Moda. Besides each of the ceramic trees is a handwritten letter from the artist explaining their connection to the West Side. There's nothing written about the West Side if you look for it. Graciela Sanchez with the Esperanza Center hopes more people will come and see the West Side through the eyes of the artists who live here. All we hear is negative stuff about being Mexican, being from the West Side, and it's growing. It's not getting better. So this kind of gives you a more complete and complex look at the West Side. All of the trees are for sale, proceeds going to Mujeres de Artes, and the exhibit will be open to the public through November 11th. Camelia Juarez, Kisa 12 News. More than 250 beach volleyball players brought their best stuff to a tournament today in an effort to remember and honor a man and a woman that are no longer with us. Matt and Sunday Ro Rowan tragically died in a hot air balloon accident in Lockhart back in 2016. Now hundreds come together every year to play in a volleyball tournament to honor the San Antonio couple. It was Matt's favorite sport and while fundraising is a big part of the event, people say their main goal is to just come out and play and remember their friend. Fundraising is an amazing part of it, but it's a big part of the community. Matt was integral to San Antonio volleyball, and so it's to come out and play in his name and in his honor. And all the money raised today goes to a scholarship in Matt's name. Really nice day for that and anything that was done outdoors. It feels like we've we've kind of turned the corner now. It doesn't it feel feels... like we're immediately walking out and you're in the oven anymore. <laughs> and so I think by this time good. next weekend, we're really going to be there turning the corner, starting to feel some fall like air, at least work into South Central Texas in some way, shape or form. We know that it was an incredibly hot summer, the hottest summer ever recorded here in San Antonio. August was the hottest month that we have ever seen on record. Now that we are wrapping up this month of September, that record breaking trend continues. In fact, with an average temperature of 87 degrees, we have broken the record for the hottest September that we've ever seen with those records dating back to 1885. By the way, the average temperature, all of the morning lows, all of the afternoon highs averaged out over that 30 day period. So now we have surpassed 2019 that previously was in the top spot. And as we take a look at each and every day, individually, those average temperatures were what we consider above average. So the lowest high temperature that we actually saw was 93 degrees. So we have continued to tack on to even the consecutive stretch of 90 degree plus days. Today, our afternoon high was 95 officially in San Antonio. So we are at 115 consecutive 90 degree plus days and counting. You can see that we are just going to tack on to that tomorrow. We've got a forecast high around 93 here in town, and we should start to see those afternoon highs come down by a degree or two each afternoon through Wednesday, but still hotter than average. Our average high for this time of year is 87 degrees in the Alamo City. But the elephant in the room, we've got a front. The first cool front of the season is actually expected to move through Wednesday night and early Thursday, and after that, it is looking like 
like we'll see some more fall like air start to work in and those afternoon highs come down into the 80s and it also brings with it a better chance for some scattered rain and thunderstorms. So let's talk about that setup. High pressure and control right now. That's still going to be the case for the most part tomorrow, Monday and into Tuesday, which is why we just have isolated rain chances in the forecast. But by early Wednesday morning, eyes are going to shift farther up to the north. An area of low pressure is going to be approaching the Great Lakes region. That is what's going to drive this front into northern Texas by Wednesday night, starting to see some rain near Dallas, Wichita Falls, stretching back over to San Angelo. Then through the overnight hours Wednesday and into early Thursday morning, we see that front move into south central Texas. We've got about a 60% potential for some scattered rain and thunderstorms back in the forecast, lingering throughout the day on Thursday as that starts to work its way farther off to the south. And then we see those north winds kick in and drier air works in as well. So again, just isolated tomorrow, Monday and Tuesday. Not everybody's going to see it, but a good idea to keep the rain gear in the car should you briefly tap into a quick shower. And then after that, we'll start to see those rain chances increase by Wednesday night. So until then, KSAT 12 hour forecast for your Sunday 73 tomorrow at 7 a.m. 86 by lunchtime and a high temperature pointed around 93 in the afternoon. Coverage is expected to be limited just about 20 to 30 percent over the next 72 hours. And then we start to see those welcome changes move in. Definitely something to check back in on in the coming days as we really start to fine tune that timing. But I think everybody is excited for at least some relief when it comes to rain chances and those temperatures, guys. Yeah, looking forward to that Wednesday, Thursday chance right there. Yes, Thanks, not quite sweater weather, but getting close. <laughs> yes, in the right direction. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Texas football, high school football, too big to fit into one night. We've got leftovers. We have so much to bring you and specifically a few of the area's top ranked teams hit the gridiron for some key high school football matchups featured in big game coverage and the number three Texas Longhorns come out victorious in a battle of undefeated teams. If there was one fan base who was ready to get to work, it was the construction crew of the Johnson student section. As for the workers on the field, the third ranked Jaguars were taking on the ninth ranked Broncos of Brandeis. Just before halftime, Johnson QB Ty Hawkins throws a screen to King Johnson, who hurdles a defender and keeps pushing his way inside the 10 yard line. A couple of plays later, a handoff to Loren Johnson, who jukes out a few defenders on his way in the end zone. Johnson goes on to win this one 46 to 20. Well, over at the Gus, as you can see, the feathers were flowing in a bird fight in a district 29 6 a showdown between the fifth ranked Harlan Hawks looking to stand defeated and the Stevens Falcons looking for their second district win. First drive for Harlan and QB Nora F Ferris finds Peyton Matthews over the middle as he falls inside the 10 yard line. Then came a third and goal from one yard out and a QB sneak for Ferris who pushes his way in for the touchdown. Harlan rolls on in this one to win 42 to 7. Steve Sarkeesian's third ranked Texas pro football program hosting number 24 Kansas for a battle between two undefeated teams. Kansas without its star quarterback Jalen Daniels, who was ruled out with back stiffness and right away Texas finds the end zone. Quinn Ewer scores from 30 yards out the Longhorns lead 7 nothing. Second quarter Jason Bean on the run. He gets hit hard and the ball pops loose. But teammate Daniel Hishaw has his back and takes it to the house to put Kansas on the board. This man right here, Jonathan Brooks, was unstoppable for the Longhorns. Brooks, the team's home run hitter, rushed for 217 yards and two TDs, including that one as Texas wins 40-14, improving to 5-0.
I'm very, very pleased at the maturity of our team because I think that's what you have to do as you grow throughout the season. You have to show maturity um, and you have to continue to improve. You know, championship teams get better during the season. And I think that that's something that we've been able to do here through five weeks. Connor Wigman is out for the season, so Texas A&M looks to its veteran Southpaw Max Johnson to lead the way against Arkansas in the confines of AT&T Stadium. Johnson throws an early touchdown to Evan Stewart to give the Aggies the lead. The A&M defense put forth another outstanding performance like they have all season. Seven sacks the unit finished with along with 15 tackles for loss, but it didn't stop there. Chris Russell intercepts the tipped pass and takes it to the end zone for the pick six and the Aggies go on to win 34 to 22. Johnson threw for 210 yards and two touchdowns. He also had three turnovers in the second half. Pure chaos transpired between Baylor and Central Florida this afternoon. The Bears erased a 35 to 7 third quarter deficit. I repeat 35 to 7 to come back and defeat UCF 36 to 35 in the night's Big 12 debut. There's the go ahead field goal that would later mark the largest 28 point comeback in BU history. Regardless of how it happened though, it was a much needed win for the Bears as they improve to two and three. And coming up later in the night beat, Texas State had a field day at Southern Miss. We'll show you the best highlights to come out of the Bobcats big win. More football. More football. We'll stand by for that. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Still ahead, changing the grade. A month ago, a barbacoa restaurant failed its health inspection. Find out why the script was flipped pretty quickly behind the kitchen door. Well, talk about a turnaround. Last month, a barbacoa restaurant on the west side flunked its health inspection, but this month it nearly aced its inspection. And a popular south side taco house racked up nine repeat violations in their inspection, so as expected, they got a lower score. And I got a look behind the kitchen door. Vicky's Barbacoa, located in the 1700 block of Pin Road, failed its health inspection on August 12th, earning a score of 69. But just a few weeks later, they reversed that score to a 96 on a follow-up inspection. Here's how they got the low score. Raw Barbacoa was sitting in still water at incorrect temps. Produce items were moldy. A worker was prepping raw meat, then touched a scale and other surfaces without hand washing. Another worker wasn't wearing a hairnet or hat. Laundry detergent was used to clean the floors and vents. A powder cleaner was stored above raw meat, and the inspector warned them to never wash hands with bleach or other chemicals. There were ants in the kitchen and pest activity was evident throughout the establishment. Food items were being stored in t-shirt bags, and they were caught still using those bags on the follow-up inspection. <laughs> Oscar's Taco House, located at 705 Barrett Place, earned a 75 on their recent inspection that included nine repeat violations. Foods cooked the day before were not cooled properly, while other foods were not being held at proper cold temps. The ice machine had black residue inside, the sanitizing bucket for cleaning towels didn't have enough bleach, and several towels were found left out on prep tables. A worker was seen wiping their hands on their shirt, then proceeded cleaning prep areas. Another was using bare hands to touch food. A large pot of cooked turkey was sitting on the floor near a cold hold unit that was leaking and pooling water. A reinspection was required. <laughs> El Patasino Mexican restaurant in the 7200 block of San Pedro got a 78 on their August inspection, one point lower than the score they had last time they were featured here on BKD. This time around, the violations included improperly storing foods, a cook touching food with bare hands, a leaky freezer that was creating foul-smelling stagnant water. The entire place was in need of a deep cleaning. A reinspection was ordered. <laughs> Oasis Cafe downtown in the 300 block of Main Avenue earned an 82 and a reinspection. They had some problems with roaches. They were told to hire pest control and fix several large holes in the walls. The owner told the inspector he had requested the landlord make repairs. 
They also needed to remove large amounts of grease and oil by the fryer that could be a hazard. For BKD, Tim Gerber, KSAT 12 News. The family of a girl killed by police in Philadelphia has reached a settlement in a federal lawsuit surrounding her death. Officers shot and killed eight-year-old Fanta Billity back in August 2021 after police opened fire on a car outside a high school football game. The officers involved were fired and sentenced to probation in the little girl's death. Her family will receive $11 million as part of the settlement and Changes have been made to Philadelphia police training since. A family spokesperson says no amount of money will ever erase the memory of this horrible tragedy. Federal prosecutors cited former President Donald Trump's visit to a gun store in South Carolina in a court filing on Friday, saying he would be violating his release conditions as a criminal defendant and breaking the law if he purchased a gun during a visit to a South Carolina gun store. The Glock is 550 to 600. These are from 300 to 400, depending on the All future. Right, so, and the Glock is to charge a premium just yeah. because of the name. Yeah. That is video from that visit. Trump visiting the gun shop during a campaign stop this week. A campaign spokesman for Trump posted on social media that Trump bought a Glock in South Carolina on Monday, then removed the post saying the former president had not purchased the firearm. Prosecutors say Trump reposted a video later asserting he in fact bought the weapon and that a video shows him with the gun. Well, stick with us. We take you on a ride to learn more about San Antonio's car culture. A closer look at a few lowriders and what they mean to Hispanic heritage next on The Night Beat. For Hispanic Heritage Month, the San Antonio Airport has a new display to celebrate the Alamo City's car culture. We're talking lowriders here and the artistry behind those vehicles. RJ Marquez and photojournalist Adam Barraza share the history and meaning behind these cars. From custom paint jobs to bouncing hydraulics, each one of these lowriders tells its own story. Man, a lot goes into lowrider. A lowrider is an extension of the person. You know, most of these cars are dedicated to somebody, you know, from their fa from their family, from their past. We got the chance to ride with some of these car owners from Callahan to Culebra on their way to the airport. It's beauty. It's mesmerizing. It's it's watching a kid seeing a lowrider for the first time, going, "What? Wow!" As they cruise down the streets, all eyes are on these custom works of art. These cars are meant to be seen. They're not meant to be kept in the garage. Joe De La Rosa owns a '59 Chevy Impala. He says that there's not much that compares to driving his lowrider. If it's once a month, maybe twice a month, um, it, it's it's like a a place that you've been waiting to be at. Lowriding is a way of life for these owners. Stacy Stewart was born into the San Antonio car culture. His dad founded one of the iconic lowrider clubs in San Antonio, First Impressions. I said he would take his cars to the next level of building it. When you have a lowrider, you get to create your own dream of a car, like you, you, your own color, your own interior all of the specialties you want to do to a car. Stacy installed thousands of dollars worth of hydraulics in this car, and it definitely makes an impression. Spins, there's a gear in here with fluid. It spins and it shoots the fluid up to the front, and that's what makes the car go up and down. Cruising downtown, you get tourists that, that like what they see. Um, like I said, I put it on, hit the hydraulics, hop it. It's just something different, you know? Lowriders can be traced back to the 1940s and 50s. They became popular as many Mexican Americans or Chicanos on the West Coast, the Southwest, and Texas wanted to express more of their culture. It's a time timeless effort, but it's definitely worth it. Um, the pride that goes into it is something that's unmatched. These cars are now on display at the airport for Hispanic Heritage Month. Generations of stories and history on four wheels. My hope is that I can inspire others to be able to join what I would call the culture, the, the sport of the love of, of low riding. So like we're finally getting uh, a platform to where we can highlight the beauty of our culture. RJ Marquez, Case at 12 News. <laughs> well, if you're interested in seeing more of those stories of Hispanic Heritage Month, we have you covered. Just scan this QR code on your screen and see all of KSAT's Hispanic Heritage Month coverage. Another look at the weather right after the break.